Jones is here from in New York, and Democratic strategist Anton Seawright joins us from Columbia, South Carolina. And Sher Michael Singleton is a Republican political consultant. He joins us from D.C. Caitlin, I want to start with you. Maybe you can set the facts straight. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like to me that he's going to try and protect DACA, um, DACA mm -hmm. recipients from being deported for three years in exchange mm -hmm. to get money for that border wall. Mm -hmm. He wants McConnell to pass it. He's going to present it to the Senate. Mm -hmm. Where do you think this is going to go? Well, Democrats have already said that this is not something that they are going to support, and for a couple of different reasons. One, they say that they want to open up the government before they have any talks on immigration. And they also argue that the reason that many DACA recipients are in limbo are because the, the, the president ended the program, putting it into the courts, and it's still kind of mired up in the courts. The Supreme Court just this past week saying they're not going to take it up yet, and now uh, now that it will kind of remain for several months. They also argue that it doesn't include a path to citizenship, which is something that they have wanted, and that it is still very temporary. They wanted more permanent fixes. But the strategy from the White House and from some Republicans who support the president is that this is putting the ball back in the Democrats' court, that the president at least is showing that he is negotiating here or wanting to negotiate. So from a PR perspective, they think that this is something that will apply pressure to Democrats. Mm. I want to tell you, just shortly before the president uh, made that address, we did get a statement from Nancy Pelosi just minutes before. And, and the sense is, I don't want to read the whole thing, but it essentially says that, called this um, a compilation of severally previously rejected initiatives, unacceptable, does not represent good faith, no starter, some of the words she's using. Um, bottom line is, even before hearing the proposal, she's saying no game here. Antoine Seawright, I want to ask you, your Democratic strategist, I mean, at some point, the Democrats have to give something, too, and it appears that they're not going to cave on this. Well, I call this the old throw and attempt to release um, by the president, throw out a plan to attempt to release political pressure because he's starting to feel it, as polls have indicated, and 2020 Dems who are up for re-election where the maps look very favorable for Democrats are starting to feel it as well. And what people know is that the federal government uh, employee, federal government employees should not be held hostage because of this plan. I think what you also hear from some Republicans in the Senate may not be publicly, but privately, they'll tell you, is that there's no education in the second kick of the mule. There have been proposals brought to this president that he asked for um, in the last Congress, bipartisan proposal that did a number of these things, and he turned around at the pure public pressure from his base and rejected these proposals. And so he cannot negotiate in good faith. I think Speaker Pelosi and her caucus have been very clear. Let's reopen the federal government. Then we'll work towards comprehensive immigration reform to include the things to do a long-term fix, not these temporary fixes such as three years that we heard from this president. And the fact that this president has a short memory. We have a DACA crisis because of him. The TP crisis is because of him. This manufactured outrage is all because of him. I call it a crisis of convenience. Uh, no, the number of illegal people attempting to come into this country are down from two years ago. Where was this outrage? Where was this crisis? Where was all of this this fierce urgency of now two years ago when the numbers were higher than when they were than they are right now? I want to turn now to, to Sher Michael uh, Singleton, mm -hmm. who's a Republican political consultant. So, Sher Michael, I mean, the truth is this is going to head to the Senate, but it's probably likely not going to go anywhere in the House. What do you think? Right. Well, yeah, it's not going to go anywhere in the House at all. And Caitlin articulately pointed this out when she was speaking accurately. I, I believe that what the president is attempting to do is throw in some things that Democrats do support and sort of force their hand to say, no, we will not support this piece of legislation because you continue to ask for the—I think he's at $5.8 billion uh, for the wall. That would give him the ability to say, look, I at least attempted to compromise here. But what's interesting about this, and Antoine alluded to this, last year, in the Senate when Democrats and Republicans came together, many of the things that the president spoke of in his remarks were in what both sides attempted to bring together last year. And the president first said he was going to support it, and then days later he came out and said he was not going to support it after getting uh, pressure from some in the conservative base. Uh, the president also said some things that were inaccurate. He talked about drugs pouring into the country. 
Uh, there's a trial going on right now in New York with El Chapo, where former drug smugglers stated an overwhelming majority of drugs that are brought into the country come through legal ports of entry. The president also talked about the failure of previous administrations. That was also inaccurate. Uh, president Obama was actually coined deporter-in-chief because he deported so many individuals during his eight-year tenure. Let's also keep in mind, in 2006, the Strong Fence Act passed by both Republicans and Democrats uh, that essentially placed 647 miles of fencing along the border. Well, from 2010 and 2015, data from U.S. Border and Customs Patrol indicated that that fencing was breached over 9,000 times, which cost taxpayers millions of dollars. So what the president is talking about, one, just does not work effectively, and two, you would likely have to utilize eminent domain for some of those places, which most Republicans will not support. And he has yet to address the continued maintenance costs uh, for something that he's talking about. So I think there are a lot of holes here in the president's remarks that are just going to make Democrats not be willing to come up with a compromise uh, for him. Sure, or Michael, with him, I interesting. Say. Uh, you know, I mentioned you're a Republican political strategist. To hear your take on that, it, Ann Coulter waited, another um, conservative mm -hmm. who says, and this is what she had to say just a few minutes ago, a hundred miles of border wall in exchange for amnesty, millions of illegals. So if we grant citizenship to a billion foreigners, Maybe we can get a full blown, a full border wall. Trump proposes amnesty. We voted for Trump and got Jeb. Caitlin, we also know that in the House, they're going to, Nancy Pelosi says there's about six different bills they're trying mm -hmm. to push forward to reopen. Any mm -hmm. luck with that? Well, they have been, the House under uh, Pelosi now is controlled by Democrats. They have been uh, putting forward bills and passing them over the past week or so to reopen portions of the government, fund portions of the government. Uh, they also want to apply pressure back on Demo uh, back on Republicans by uh, putting forward measures that the Senate has already passed uh, before uh, Trump kind of backtracked on the border wall and said that he was, this is going to be his, his position. This is before the government shutdown. So a lot of, of, of both sides trying to put pressure on the other. Uh, but the the Republicans in the Senate have already said, under the leadership of Mitch McConnell, who is the Senate majority leader, that they're not going to pass anything that the president himself won't sign. So uh, we're still kind of in this limbo position with both sides, at least at this point, uh, pretty firm in their positions. Now, the president uh, providing this today, we'll see what Democrats come back with. But for now, they're saying that this is not sufficient. This is not something that they could support. And remember, the president needs Democrats for anything uh, that will get through Congress, not mm -hmm. only because uh, Democrats control the House, but because they don't have a supermajority in the Senate. Mm -hmm. So they still need Democrats votes in the Senate. You're already hearing from people like Dick Durbin, uh, Dick Durbin, a, um, a leader in, in the Democrats on the Senate side, say that he's not going to support this. So, Antoine, I want to ask you, it, it, Democrats, uh, somebody needs to come to the middle of the road, right? They, they've got to get together at some point. How do you make that happen? Well, I think, first and foremost, reopening the government. And I think uh, you have to crawl before you walk, as we say down here in the South. And I think crawling in this case is reopening the federal government. Uh, keep in mind, as the even though Congress has a low approval rating, they can walk and chew gum at the same time. And so I think uh, Republicans in the Senate, particularly uh, 2020 Republicans, are probably sooner rather than later will say, you know what, let's come together and put our federal employees back to work. It's so hypocritical hip about the Republican Party to talk about being American first when 800,000 American federal workers are laid off and held hostage because of the president's uh, campaign promise of building a wall that Mexico was supposed to pay for. So I think that's the first step. And then from there, I think you will probably see um, some reasonable, moderate Republicans and some Democrats say, come together, you know what, let's put some money for border security, like we did last year with the $1.6 billion allocated for border security. By the way, the president has spent less than 10 percent of that up to this point. And you'll start to see, piece by piece, bit by bit, a plan to work towards an immigration reform package to include border security, to include something that would take care of dreamers, to include fixing the many holes that we have in our immigration system that people can live with in the long term, not just the short term. Uh, I want to also turn to Sher, uh, Sher Michael Singleton. Uh, Sher Michael, our understanding is is probably within the next 30 minutes or so, mm -hmm. uh, Republican leadership will be gathering together to conference and, and sort of discuss this plan. Just based on Twitter, 
on the reaction from conservatives on the right, this did not go down well. Uh, they were very upset about this, the way this was handled with DACA and, and what was being exchanged. What do you think the Republican leadership needs to do in that meeting this afternoon? Well, look, I think Mitch McConnell has to shore up some of those more moderate uh, senators, such as Su Susan Collins, and, and, and there are others that are up for re-election, uh, as Antoine uh, alluded to. In, in 2020, there are, I believe, 18 or a little bit more than 18 Republican senators up for re-election. In some of those states, Donald Trump did not win by a large margin, and in some states, he didn't win at all. Uh, if you look at the Senate map, at, at least currently, Democrats, I would say, uh, one could argue, are, are favored to take the Senate. And so, Mitch McConnell has to figure out a way to keep uh, those senators at bay. And, and I'm not certain how much longer he will have before he has to go to the president and say, Mr. President, I just don't have the support in the Senate. We have to compromise. I, I think the burden here is more so on Republicans, politically speaking, than it is on Democrats. I mean, uh, over a majority of, of the American people, according to every legitimate poll, believe that this is a result of President Trump and Republicans. Republicans' inability and unwillingness to compromise uh, with Democrats. So, again, politically, I, I don't think the odds are in favor of, of Republicans. And Mitch McConnell, who has seen his poll numbers in his own home state uh, decrease significantly, is also thinking about the political outcome for him, where the president is far more uh, popular uh, in Kentucky than, than Mitch McConnell. So, when you think about the political dynamics here, uh, you begin to really see why McConnell is doing some of the things that he's doing. But you also see why the president is being such a hardliner here. You, you read the quote uh, from Ann Coulter. You also have to think about folks over at Fox News, for example, or some folks on conservative radio who are going to say, this is not conservative enough. If the president doesn't stand by this, we cannot continue to support him. So everyone, I would argue, uh, are both sides are looking at the political dynamics here. But again, I think Republicans have far more to lose than Democrats. Mm. Sure, Michael, before you go, I do want to ask you, we were talking sort of about the reaction from uh, conservatives on Twitter, some well-known conservatives who are upset mm -hmm. about this DACA deal, potential deal. Do you think that this potentially could be the president who could do something significant in immigration reform that no other president has been able to do? I, I don't think so. Um, I, Donald Trump, and I hate to say this, but he, he has proven himself not to be a trustworthy person. And I think that's why Nancy Pelosi uh, is really hesitant to try to negotiate with him. As I mentioned earlier, remember last year, Republicans and Democrats came together in the Senate to come up with comprehensive Im immigration reform. The president first said he was going to agree to what they proposed, and then only days later completely flipped the script, and you saw it completely unravel. So, I think from the Democrats' perspective, one, they don't have a mandate to work with him, and two, they have to ask themselves, can we even trust what the president tells us? And I think history proves they can't. Sure, Michael. I want to thank you very much for joining us. Sure, Michael Singleton, Antoine Seawright, and of course, our very own Caitlin Huey Burns. Thank you all three for your analysis. Thanks so much. Thank you.